Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Rotary Club of Wellington, serving humanity from the heart of Wellington since 1921. Uh, at the President's table today, uh, the guest speaker is Andrew Little on the future of New Zealand economy and the New Zealand Labour Party's plan to back the Kiwi dream. Uh, with uh, Andrew is Martin Taylor, the Director of Policy and Research. Uh, welcome in to both of you. Uh, also at the table is Richard, who's going to do the introducing and thanking, uh, and Gray Hewson, who's going to be the sergeant for today. The theme for today really has come down to dreams. Uh, and thinking big. And uh, this has been an outstanding part. You can see today the closing ceremony of the Olympics with the theme of New Zealand th uh, Dream Big uh, that we've actually ended up with 18 medals, four golds, nine silvers and five bronze, which is an outstanding uh, result uh, uh, for New Zealand. And uh, in strange sports, really, that you wouldn't often associate uh, us with winning with, so it's been an outstanding result. And also, um, in dreams, who would have dreamed that we would beat Australia 42-8 uh, on Saturday night? But, uh, and in dreaming big, we've got a forest at the heart of Wellington working towards 100,000 trees, uh, by 2021, and with the 3,000 that we've planted so far this year, uh, we are up to 40,000 with 60,000 to go over the next uh, five or six years. So thank you to the team who went out and planted more trees uh, at the weekend as part of that uh, uh, project. Just a reminder for mobile phones and name badges. Mobile phones first, please make sure they're on silent or off. Uh, and if you haven't picked up your name badge and dob, look around the table now, if somebody's not wearing it, dob them in and make them uh, pay up uh, already, uh, or pick it up in the break. Uh, in welcoming guests, could I ask, uh, even though Helen, this is uh, a repeat, I'll still ask you to uh, introduce uh, Roger. Roger, welcome in again. Uh, Martin, could I ask you to introduce your guests, please? I have uh, Jenna, my wife, and Kevin, my son, who are the family out today. Uh, <laughs> welcome in. And Susan, your guest, please. Janine and Steve, welcome. Uh, world travellers uh, returning, and I know there are some very, uh, no, there are a number here. Uh, Sir Anand, uh, Leslie, Tricia, uh, uh, welcome. And you know the deal, please uh, contribute in for the luxury of your travel. Uh, pay that green tax. Uh, and uh, world travellers uh, departing. Good. It's a lot of travel. It's a, uh, thank you. Uh, could I ask uh, Donna to say grace, please? We have just enjoyed the two week feast of sport for the Olympic Games. From while there were challenges leading up to the event, the athletes of the world were still able to join together to compete in the vast range of sports. The young men and women in the New Zealand team have had us both in cash and kind for the last four years. It's been a real team effort to get them there. It's been a 
today's time to reflect is without exception they represented us with honor and in some cases glory. And to thank them for their demonstration of what it is to be a New Zealander. Thanks, Donna. Uh, birthdays, four birthdays, uh, Owen uh, Gibson, 17th of August, uh, uh, Katie on the 18th of August, Samuel Stevens on the 19th, uh, and uh, Olivier uh, on the 20th of August. Uh, happy birthday to all of you. Uh, I'll now ask uh, Gray as Sergeant to host the Sergeant session, please. Good afternoon, President Mark, uh, fellow Rotarians and uh, guests who are here today. There have been a number of centenary celebrations this year, so I thought we'd look at uh, three of them that are actually represented by the top table here uh, to extract some money from the rest of you uh, for the Sunshine Box. So we'll start off with uh, Defence, which is represented by our esteemed President. The Featherston Military Camp trained a number of New Zealand uh, soldiers to serve in World War I, and in fact was the largest training establishment in Australasia at the time. Aratoy Museum in Masterton recently hosted an exhibition which marked the centenary of that camp which was established in 1916, when the military became aware at the time that the war was going to last much longer than was first thought. This camp was a model of uh, military efficiency aiming to provide the best possible training for soldiers leaving New Zealand to fight overseas. So your first question is how many soldiers served overseas during World War I? Those who got B were obviously correct. Those who didn't will pay up shortly. <laughs> how many of those soldiers who went overseas were actually trained in Featherston? The answer is C. So if you didn't get the correct answer to either of those questions, this is your first opportunity to pay up. On 18th of September this year, there was a centennial ceremony at Pukiahu National War Memorial Park to commemorate those who served and died on the Western Front in France in 1916. After some 30 plus battles involving the Allied forces during 1914 and 1915, the 1916 year ushered in two of the most notorious battles of that great war. First one, the Battle of Verdun, or Verdun, lasted for almost the entire 1916 year and became known as the mincing machine for the Allied troops, resulting in over 540,000 casualties by the end of that year. The second major battle was, in 1916 was the Battle of the Somme, where many New Zealanders were deployed after serving in Gallipoli. That first offensive began on the 1st of July 1916 and concluded in November that year. The 1st of July, that date, was notorious as the date of the largest loss on any single day in the history of the British Army. So, any takers? Right. The answer was C, 58,000. As some 19,000 of those 58,000 actually lost their lives that day, all of us can now pay up to honour those who served our country in World War I. <laughs> Moving now on to politics, we welcome Andrew Little today to update us on his vision for New Zealand Labour Party, who also celebrated their centenary this year. As I read, the Labour Party was formed in 1916 from a, co a collection of trade union or trade councils and the Social Democrat Party. And the purpose of it at the time was to oppose the government's determination to impose conscription to provide manpower for the war effort. Some of the early party's executive were actually imprisoned 
by opposing conscription as they campaigned for better pay for soldiers and their families. By the time World War II broke out in 1939, Labor had gained the Treasury benches following their innovative policies developed through the Great Depression of the 1930s under the leadership of Michael Joseph Savage. How many parliamentary terms have Labor presided over since Michael Savage became their first Prime Minister? All right, the answer is 11. In my former life as a chartered accountant, I spent several years as an audit clerk working on the Labour Party audit. In the days when... <laughs> the days when professionals were expected to wear ties, and I remember going out deliberately and buying a tie which had equal sized red and blue stripes to wear on the job to show that I was non-partisan. So in order to preserve the same non-partisan approach today, the next question... <coughs> right, the answer is 16. So if you got the wrong answer to either of those questions, please pay up. Interestingly, one of National's Prime Ministers um, had the distinction of being both the shortest and the longest serving Prime Minister. Same person, it was Keith Holdyake. He served for three months in 1957 before losing the election to Walter Nash and then came back in 1960 and served for 12 years. But going back to the Labour Party, who was their shortest serving Prime Minister? The answer was Hugh Watt, who was there, he was there for six days. <laughs> and I guess the final question on politics that you'll all know the answer to, who was the longest serving Labour Prime Minister? Helen, Helen Clark. Okay, let's wrap up with education. The establishment of the first school in New Zealand predates the Labour Party, who are 100 years old, by another 100 years. And as we have a number of educators in our club, here's a question on the location of the first school in New Zealand that opened in 1816. <laughs> the answer is Oihi, which is in the Bay of Islands um, in uh, Rangahua Bay. And just finally, this week there's a gathering uh, of Scots College Old Boys to mark the centenary of their school, which uh, commenced in the grounds of what is now Queen Margaret College in Hobson Street before moving to its present site in Strathmore. And this club is very well represented by Scots Old Boys. So if you've got one sitting at your table and they're attending the celebrations this weekend, then everyone else at your table should, uh, if the Scots guys would own up, should now pay up to release the remaining coins from your pockets. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Craig. Um, Alexandra, are you right for five minutes? Good. Uh, the five minute uh, talk today is by Alexandra here. Uh, welcome. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko tānaki i te maunga, ko taupo roto, no whanganoi a hau, ko Alexandra tako ingoa. Hello everyone and thank you for this opportunity to introduce myself. This morning I woke up with a song in my head, sweet dreams are made of this, who am I to disagree, the Eurythmics. I knew it was going to be a great day. I wish to share with you a little of my makeup. I'm one part rural New Zealand that has a base of good, honest, hard work. Two parts scientist and executive manager, a splash of creative flair and a dash of passionate chemistry that, it, that creates excitement with anything I get involved with. I'm from a small rural town called Maxwell in South Taranaki, where I was raised by two fantastic parents. Here I learned from these two wonderful human beings that you open your home, hosting and sharing with your community, and it's a natural, wonderfully, wonderfully great part of life. 
I learned an, the appreciation for life and death at a young age, witnessing and being involved with death of stock and birth of stock on the farm. I learned to respect the power of the natural environment, its determination over the success of a crop failure, a success or failure of a crop, its ability to disempower and empower our community through snow, flood, slips and wind. And I also learned that I was privileged to have an education. Along with the le our legacy of women in my family, I was schooled at Natawa Wellington Diocesan School for Girls. This school is known for its equestrian charm, its academic uh, competition, synchronised swimming, and producing strong, fairly opinionated, independent young women. <laughs> Thank you for answering. <laughs> University of Otago was my choice to undertake a Bachelor of Science. Knox College and the University of Geography Department supported the concept in order to develop a well-rounded university education. A strong balance must be struck between socialing, social, socialising, quite a fair bit, and uh, studying, nourishing both personality and technical credibility. My early New Zealand career was a mix between environmental advisory roles in the rural sector and local government, then shifting to one of the most technically credible and outstanding industries in New Zealand, the geothermal industry at Wairaki Power Station. As an advisor there, a woman, four of 150 staff, and a new entrant into the electricity industry in New Zealand, the experience of station life formed my intrigue and courage and passion about the energy industry and a deeper understanding of the strength that it takes to survive. And also launched my career into the electricity and energy industry further afar. My career has taken me to a few parts of the world. Australia to lead and advise environmental impact between in the uh, coal seam methane and liquefied natural gas developments. Analyzing environmental and social impacts of the gas industry in Papua New Guinea. And to Dubai, United Arab Emirates, where I analysed environmental and social baseline in the West Kuna oil fields of southern Iraq. My recent career move has moved me into executive management and improved business performance within scientific and engineering divisions. And currently I have the pleasure of being a group manager at Opus with a water and environmental engineering team. And our key focus at the moment is looking at resilient three waters infrastructure and how we can use and influence the dynamics of water for sustainability of this resource for generations to come. So how on earth did I end up standing in front of you all? Well, in 2010, I had the pleasure of meeting um, a great couple of people, Nick and Christine Hurley. At the time, I was chairwoman of the Kiwi Expatriates Association, an organisation by, uh, begun by Stephen Tyndall that aims to tap into the business community internationally. On return to New Zealand two years ago, I was invited to attend a Rotary lunch, and I did have some preconceived ideas about Rotary. So what did I find at my first uh, meeting? You all blew me away. A base of experience in business formidability. One part innovation and dynamic ability, two parts al altruistic, a splash of heckling, a dash of humour, all wrapped up in a great vessel of rich history of service to community that I could identify with. And also continue on my uh, family legacy as my father, Gerald, who passed away at Christmas, was a long serving Rotarian. After being involved with the club since January, the community worked from tree planting to mentoring skilled migrants to having the pleasure of ju judging at the Eureka candidates um, table to shaping the Good to Great Forum of hopefully you will all come along 21st of October and listening to your wonderful stories and starting in, um, to create some fantastic friendships. I thank you for your welcome. Before I end today, however, I want to present my take on some of the current challenges that I face and my peers face. I feel that we're in an era of exponential innovation, disruptive technology, a world where historically hidden information is now shared and moved around the world at an unprecedented rate. The exceeding issues of climate change, an increase in the fear and populist driven politics that seem to be relinquishing a core of love and forgiveness and respect for technical credibility and a celebration of diversity. A generation that's stuck on the monopoly board, moving the wheelbarrow around and paying more and more higher levels of rent and higher levels of debt. And also a disconnect with an ageing workforce and opportunities for adequate succession. It sounds doomed, but I am excited, don't you worry. 
I'm inexperienced in comparison to most of you in the room. You are experienced. You have war stories. You have knowledge to share. Our common ground, perhaps, is the values that we share, our sense of passion, and wonderfully, our sense of curiosity. I'm looking forward to bringing these things together as I get to know each of you. So maybe that's why I had the Eurythmics playing in my head this morning when I woke up. I'm excited about being involved with this club and how our collective minds can tackle some significant community challenges. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks, Alexandra. Uh, we're now going to do something subtly different. We, um, because we want to grow to 221 by 2021, the membership committee have got a standing two-minute slot now, and I'll just ask Martin to introduce it. So, Mark, you started the meeting by referring to being ambitious and thinking big. So that 221 by 2021 is the idea I want everyone to keep in their minds. It's about attracting new members into the club and growing the club. And just listening to Alexandra just now should be inspiration to all of us around the quality and nature of the people that can come into the, want to be part of Rotary and to build the sort of new generations that can make this club do great things for years to come. So 221 by 20. 21 are the numbers to keep in your heads. And what we're going to do over the coming weeks is we're going to keep profiling people who are actually actively working at bringing new members into the club and how you can access the information and resources so you can do it too. Because actually this is a shared responsibility we all have to grow the club together. The resources are there, it's not hard to do. And people like Helen, who is going to talk to you in just a moment, is someone who's been very active at bringing in new members, and I thought it would be helpful for Helen to kick us off by sharing some of her experiences and some of the sort of techniques she's used to help grow the club. So Helen, over to you. President, members and guests, thank you. I thought, I thought I'd talk particularly about um, my motivation and um, how I end up bringing people in, and I'm um, talking about four people in particular who I've um, introduced to the club. And I'm looking at benefits to the club, benefits to the person, and benefits to me, actually. So Derek, starting with you, as he raises his head from whatever he was writing. I used to see Derek regularly around um, refugee trauma recovery, um, when we were on the, as trustees together, and around public sector events. I knew that Derek had a heart for community service. I also knew that he knew lots of people in the club and that he would add value to the club. Um, so for those reasons, I um, invited Derek to come along and he had a look and quite quickly became a member. Um, then in the order of when they actually joined rather than when they started coming, <laughs> um, Karen Coots. So Karen as a colleague I'd admired a lot when she was working at Statistics. I invited her to Rotary first just as a chance to catch up socially over lunch. And as I got to know Karen better, I learned how much of her, a lot about her social work background and her governance intentions, and we became quite close friends. And I realised that she'd be a real asset to the club, and she really didn't take much convincing to join. And now we get to spend a whole lot more time together as friends, partly just in a club context, because we go to so many jolly meetings together. <laughs> um, then Suzanne Snively. Suzanne was someone I'd caught up with from time to time for coffee, and then more often saw her when she started to be involved in Transparency International. I think actually we'd caught up occasionally for coffee for 30 years. Um, and frankly, in Suzanne I saw an asset to the club. It took a long time to get Suzanne into the club because she was very busy. She is very busy. And then um, one meeting she said, you know, at this one lunch I've managed to talk to four people that saves me having four meetings that I would have had to set up and go somewhere and meet with them. 
And so, sort of, as an economist, she figured out that there was a benefit <laughs> in joining this club. Um, she came so many times before joining that I want to raise something that's a bit sensitive with some people around bringing new members. Suzanne came quite often, and at $28 a pop, that was expensive. And so right from the very beginning, Suzanne said, can't I pay? And I said, well, no, it's not the etiquette of the club. You pay for your own guests. And then I went and talked to the membership committee, who said, no, well, actually, that doesn't apply anymore, Helen. Lots of people just bring someone as a guest once, and then they pay for themselves after that. So for some people who, for whom, I mean, if, if I paid for Suzanne... I think she came 10, maybe 12 times before she joined. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's worth remembering if that is a barrier and you know that you've got someone who will take a long time to make up their minds. Um, um, then Roger Blakely. I had a coffee catch up with Roger about six weeks ago. Just um, Roger used to be my chief executive at Internal Affairs and we kept up over the years, and I realised quite quickly that the club would be good for Roger, and Roger would be good for the club. And like Suzanne, he seemed to know so many people when he walked into the room, I don't have to look after him as a guest, he's roving around talking to everybody. Um, so he decided to come for five meetings, I think this is the fourth, and then he's coming to the... Um, the fifth Sunday, fifth Monday, sorry, for um, the local government um, panel. And I've heard him say to two people today that, yeah, he's pretty keen to join. Um, so that's five. <laughs> um, then talking about the fifth Monday, I've got four guests coming. Roger, um, a friend, and also two former members. Um, Stephen Hay, who's interested in coming back to the club, he is that it's got um, younger and more diverse since he was last here, so he's interested in having another look. And Fraser Carson, who does so much for us on the forum, is going to come along. Um, I'm not sure whether Fraser's going to join again, but it's worth keeping on trying. And so just as you can see, for me, there are benefits when I'm looking at new members for the club, benefits for the person, and benefits for me. Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, fellowship time, but take no more than five minutes to go and get.